Back in 1989, when I was a student at uh, McGill University, I developed uh, what became the first internet search engine. So the predecessor to um, Google and Bing and all of those things. It sort of happened organically. Um, so there really wasn't sort of, you know, a goal that I had to struggle and, you know, ford rivers and climb mountains and that kind of stuff to get to. Um, I guess the most difficult thing very early on was the fact that the powers that be didn't realize what we were doing. So we had to do it sort of under uh, cover of darkness and not let them realize that we're utilizing all these resources and, um, and uh, you know, shut us down because they didn't really understand what was going on. So there was, it wasn't as if we could have gone to them and said, hey, you know, we have this great new idea and give us all these computing resources, which were a lot more expensive at the time. We're talking almost 30 years ago. Um, and so we were in danger of being shut down. Peter Deutsch was, um, Peter J. Deutsch, there are several of them, um, was, as I said, my boss. And he and I then ended up forming a company to, uh, m to market this. Um, and so I guess he would have been one of the major players. Um, and another guy called Bill, Bill Heeland, who was one of my co-workers who helped me work on the, on the, the second version of this uh, after I had made the, the one for myself and we made it public. We worked together. Um, and then there was support from the university. Uh, there, were fair, there were some people, uh, Alan Greenberg uh, was the head of the computing science facility and he saw the value in that. The internet uh, the internet, one of the internet's greatest strengths is one of its greatest weaknesses in that it allows communities that would otherwise to be built that otherwise would never exist. Yeah. Um, people with very specific needs or interests can find one another in the world in a way that they would never have been able to before. Um, if you are a teenager in Hong Kong you, and you have a particular interest in one star um, in the galaxy that you th find really fascinating, you can actually find other people who have that fascination with that one star. Um, and it may only be 20 of you across the you know, 7 billion people on the face of the earth, but it allows you to build that community. Those communities are not always for good. Right, those communities can be uh, used for, uh, and, and as we learn over and over again, you know, not just the hackers, but the trolls, you know, the people who just, um, who are basically sociopaths who enjoy hurting other people. Um, and they can build their own communities as well. And that's not exactly a great thing. So, you know, with, with, as with most technologies, it's a double-edged sword. Um, you, you don't get the good without the bad. And our challenge is to encourage the good and discourage the bad whereas, wherever possible. Don't be complacent. Um, don't take it for granted. Uh, what you may have grown up with over the last five or 10 years uh, may not continue if you don't uh, work to ensure that it it remains open if you if you ever experience it as open in the first place um, you know uh, yeah you don't 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 expect it to just be as it is without active uh, work on your part just how big an impact it has had um, I don't think any of us who were working uh, in the late 80s and early 90s. So, so a lot of the people that you will meet here um, worked on the technical infrastructure in the sense of making sure that computers could talk to one another uh, easily, quickly, that kind of stuff. They, they're the, what we would call the lower layers of the, of the system. When I started to come into it in 89 and 90, uh, we started to work on user services, the, the things that the average user would use, as opposed to the, the technical layers, um, and, uh, or the more technical layers. And, um, 
I think we all had a sense that we were working on something that was going to change the world it, to an extent, but I don't think any of us um, really conceived of just how pervasive it would become, just how deeply embedded into society, um, how something like the smartphone would come along and you would just walk down the street and all the people were doing would be staring into their phones. And the only reason they're staring into the phones is because it's connected to the internet, right? If the phones weren't connected to the internet, yeah, you'd be playing your little games and stuff, but most of the time you wouldn't be staring into your phone. It's because of that community, that connectivity that those phones provide. And I don't think anybody back then had any idea as to just how far reaching this was going to be. I mean, the ability to um, find connection uh, in, th for example, ge genetics, right? You do a genetic test nowadays, and they can t start putting you in contact with, uh, you know, your fifth cousin from a branch of the family that you've never heard of. Um, I have any number of stories of people discovering siblings that they weren't aware of, or figure finding out that, you know, some of these things are not always positive. Um, you know, it can be very disruptive uh, to existing structures, but um, it's, I think, I mean, the, the, the common element of the internet has been disruption. Um, many of those cases, that disruption is positive. Uh, it breaks existing monopolies. It it uh, it allows the flow of information that otherwise you wouldn't have had. Um, those are positive things. Um, and so I think, on balance, the disruption and the ongoing disruption um, has been positive. Um, not always, but mostly. Well, I mean, I think this last election is a great example of um, of that. That you know, uh, that it's strong evidence that foreign powers influenced, significantly influenced uh, a, a democracy, the, one of the largest democracies in the world, um, in ways that we were just not even aware of, and, uh, and in, in subtle ways that very few people have defenses against. Um, you know, it, it's a level of psychological manipulation that we are just not prepared for. And, uh, uh, and I think those, that's a very worrying um, trend. Faster. <laughs> I mean, I mean that, that, that's sort of flippant. The internet's pretty, pretty darn fast as it is right now. Um, no, I mean, I think of, um, you know, greater uh, ac accessibility, uh, both in terms of income levels, in terms of geography. I mean, I was recently, I just, just arrived in from um, Prince Edward Island in Canada and uh, in sort of rural Prince Edward Island. I mean, most of Prince Edward Island is rural to start off with, but this is fairly far from. And the internet speeds were atrocious. <laughs> I mean, they were really, and you think, you know, for, for a, 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 it's, a, it's a large place. I mean, Canada is a large place, but it's a fairly, it's a fairly well populated place. And you would think that in this day and age, it would be better connected, you know? That's a first world problem. Um, you know, y there are still, hundreds of millions of people around the world that have no uh, reliable internet access. Uh, and, uh, and, and a lot of governments that are trying to make sure that that remains the, the case or that a lot of, even on the local level, uh, if you go into rural India, um, it is widely uh, believed that women, for example, don't have the capacity to, to, to be online. You know, same is true in the Middle East, that they don't have the mental ability to, to navigate the internet. So the, the ways that the, the, the to, to use a phrase, the patriarchy, the, to use, uh, to, um, that the existing uh, power structures that oppress minorities and, and, uh, and, and women uh, will continue to use uh, or will use uh, restrictions of access to the internet as a tool to prevent their ability to communicate and to, and to resist that oppression.